thank you all for coming out. I really appreciate the invitation. It's kind of you, and it's been fun to to see some faces that I remember from a long, long time ago, and some that I haven't seen for quite some time. And it's just a pleasure to see you all. Uh, <laughs> as Bill mentioned, uh, I spent 32 years at the Statesman Journal, and I consider that the best job any person could ever have. Um, I love getting up in the morning and going to work. I look forward to my days. Um, one of the things I loved about uh, going to work at this paper was that I never knew from one minute to the next what I would be doing. And there were no typical days. And uh, I, I, I went to a lot of exciting places. I went where there were things happening, uh, where there were really, I met really interesting people. And uh, I, uh, the 32 years that I spent on that job were uh, years that I loved, and I, uh, when it came time to retire, I, I did that with some uh, regrets. Um, I was here during uh, what turned out to me to be, or what I think has been the golden age of print journalism and photojournalism. I was right in the middle of it. I didn't know it at the time, but it was uh, from the the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, newspapers were making tons of money. They were investing in their staffs, uh, and uh, there were some major, major technological changes that took place in the way newspapers were reproduced, and in uh, uh, the way that uh, and the photo technology and the way that we were able to to, to do our work. I practiced my profession on a small stage, and that mainly was Salem and the Mid Willamette Valley. And I did have a few assignments. I, I did one, I did two, two assignments in the Soviet Union. But uh, mostly, I, I just worked on what I considered a really small stage, and it was Salem and the Mid Willamette Valley. And uh, I came into contact frequently with, with newspapers from, or with photographers from large newspapers. and. Uh, there were times when I, I thought how fortunate they were because they had a, a, a bigger a bigger palette to work with, but uh, as I uh, as I've looked at this, uh, I, I've always been glad that I stayed here. I, I had no desire to move on to to a bigger area, and, and uh, this is uh, I, I still love this area. I think Salem is a beautiful place, and the Mid Willamette Valley is a lovely place to live and to be a photographer. Photography to me has always been a kind of a miracle. I don't know how many of you think of it this way. It's so ubiquitous. We see it everywhere. And now, with, with digital cameras and cameras built into phones, there are millions of photos taken every day. And we tend to forget what a miraculous process it really is. And by miraculous, I mean you have an optical mechanical device. You point that optical mechanical device at a scene. I could do this of all you sitting here in the auditorium. And if I take my photo, that optical mechanical device will remember everything. Everything. It won't miss a detail. It'll remember Grant's brown shirt. Uh, It'll, it'll remember it'll remember all of you, everyone who's sitting in the audience. Remember your faces. You won't, get any, you won't be older. You won't be younger. It'll remember you exactly as you are today. And it'll remember that way for, should the planet survive that long? Hundreds of years, maybe, depending on storage technology and some other variables. I just think that's a miracle. I really do. It's so amazing that there's a process that does that, but we just take it so for granted because we see it so often. It's like so many other things that, that we don't stop to think about very often. I retired uh, in 2000, but before I walked out of the doors of the Statesman Journal, I witnessed some astonishing uh, and a uh, paradigm shifting changes in the technology of photography and in the future of print journalism. I moved to Salem in 1969 with my wife Penny and my first child. 
my wife Penny was a kindergarten teacher and um, she taught in the Salem School District uh, for uh, several years before uh, I lost her to cancer in, in 2000. Uh, I think she was the best kindergarten teacher <laughs> in the district. We raised three children, remarkable children, of course, and you all know about my two amazing grandchildren, right? <laughs> if not, if you'd check with me after I finish, I'd be glad to tell you. <laughs> Shortly after I began my first job as a photographer, I began to realize that the underpinning technology which made it all possible was virtually unchanged since the Civil War. Even before I was swept up into photography, I had known about the photographer Matthew Brady. And Brady is one of my heroes. He's been called the father of American photojournalism. And as time has gone on, I've developed a much greater regard and respect for Brady. He died a pauper in a New Jersey charitable hospital. But his name and his place in history was already guaranteed by his vision and his belief in a technology which was in his infancy. Brady is so well known that my guess is that 60 to 70 percent of those of you in this audience have a Brady image on your person as we speak. And let me see now. We're going to try some technology here with the. Uh, So, I'm a Mac person, and bear with me here because I'm going to get there, I think. So, this is your Brady image. Have I got this upside down? No, 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 there we go. This is an engraving of a photograph that Matthew Brady took of Abraham Lincoln, one of Lincoln's probably most uh, famous portraits. So, if you look at, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm not technically able to get both those up on the same time, but. If you look at this, you'll see this is exactly the same photo as on the $5 bill. How many of you have a $5 bill in your pocket? All right, I was right, 70%. <laughs> Matthew Brady came to fame as a practitioner of the early technology called photography. He was a portrait photographer in New York City and Washington, D.C., and established a reputation and made a small personal fortune by photographing the rich and the well-established. And as the Civil War drew near, families whose sons were leaving home to join uh, the Union armies, uh, families would bring their sons into Matthew Brady's studio to have portraits made of them in case that son didn't return from the war. What interests me most about Brady is that he was living a life of comfort and building a personal fortune when he realized that the new technology he was working with could also be used to document and re record life outside the comforts of the portrait studio. Brady, uh, the photo technology at his time was fairly crude. Photography had only been around as a usable medium for about 20 years, which is roughly the same time as we have been exposed to the internet and digital photography. And um, the cameras that they used were large, they were bulky, they were hard to move. They took their images on coated glass plates. And depending on the format of the camera, some cameras were 8 by 10s, which meant that they used an 8 by 10 sheet of plate glass, or, four by f or, or 5 by 7, which meant that they used a 5 by 7 sheet of plate glass. And the, the, the plates had to be coated shortly before the exposure was made. Because the coatings were not very sensitive to light, exposures were 
had to be long by necessity. Some of the early photos required, uh, uh, some of them were 24 hour long exposures where the, the uh, sensitized plate was exposed to light for 24 hours. By the time Brady started his practice, that time had shrunk down to about 30 seconds. But the 30 seconds time span meant that if, if you're all familiar, you've all taken photos where you, you've had somebody who suddenly has moved and, and they're running or something, and what would have been a good photo suddenly is ruined because it's blurred. You can't quite tell what it is. So the old portrait photographers and included the President of the United States had to do the same thing. You had a, a studio. You come to a studio, and you sit in a chair, and they had a rod that came up behind the subject, and it clamped at the back of the head. So you couldn't move your head back and forth, and then he would, he would say, uh, okay, Mr. President, I'm ready, and rather than, they didn't have an actual shutter mechanism that we have on our cameras today, they would take their exposure by removing the lens cap from the lens, and he would remove the lens cap, the president would sit still. That's why everybody looks so grim, by the way, in all his old photos. <laughs> and at about 30 seconds, I don't know how they timed that. I suppose maybe they counted 1,001. He would put the lens cap back on that, and the portrait was done. But some of the field photos that Brady took, you'll see horses in particular. You could tell a general to stand still, but you couldn't tell a horse to stand still. And so quite often, what you would see are a, a general who looked relatively sharp and horse that's, that you barely tell what, what the general is on. And, and that, of course, precluded action pictures or actual photographs of, of actual combat. I want to talk just real quickly about what I consider my connection back to Matthew Brady. And that is this camera, that <laughs> the first jobs that I had. I actually used one of these cameras. Uh, it's the old 4x5 Speed Graphic. And it was big and heavy and clumsy to use. But it has a similarity to Brady's camera. Let me, let me see if I can get the image of Brady's camera up here on. So Matthew Brady's camera was a lot prettier than the old speed graphics. Speed graphics were ugly, but they were functional and they worked. But the thing they all have in common is um, it's, first of all, a light tight container. This is where the film goes. And it has a bellows. This moves in and out, a lens attached to the bellows. And as the bellows moves back and forth, the image comes into focus. So if I were going to take a picture of my bottle of water, up here with this camera, I would, as I get closer, you want to have the lens farther away from the film. So I would extend this bellows out until I could see that I had this in focus, and then I would go ahead and take my... <laughs> my photo. I haven't done this, you can tell I haven't yet there. Um, but the bellows was used to focus. Brady's camera, um, actually, and, and this also has a place for, by, by the time this camera came along, they were using acetate film, and it was already sensitized. So you just put film in the back here, but uh, you'd open this up and drop a sheet of 4 by 5 film in there, and you could take one shot before you had to replace the, uh, the film. And Brady's was the same. The only problem is, is Brady had to do this all in total darkness. And uh, Brady had a, uh, had a specially built, a whole series of specially built wagons that, uh, this is one of his wagons, and this is a group of photographers that he had hired to do his photography work. But that's one of the uh, wagons that was specifically designed to be totally light proof. And so when Brady was going to take a photo, he would have to retire to his wagon. He would have to sensitize uh, his film, his 8x10 or 4x5 or 5x7 sheet, put that in his camera, take the camera out to where he was going to take his picture, make his exposure, one shot, take the camera back, 
because remember this camera's light tight there's no light getting inside except what you let in through the lens go back to his lab his portable lab a wagon a horse-drawn wagon take the film out and process the film the other connection I have with Brady is that his developing the process he used to develop his glass plates is pretty much the same process I used when I was developing 35 millimeter film at the Statesman Journal. So in the 1970s, I, I could have brought in Matthew Brady to my darkroom and had him be my photo assistant. And I could have taught him in half a day everything he would need to know to be up and running as a photographer at Statesman Journal. The same token, or go reverse, I'd have to learn how to drive a horse. <laughs> but I could go back to the Civil War, and I could be one of Matthew Brady's assistants. I could be a lab assistant or a photographer for him, and I could learn what he did. I mean, I essentially knew exactly the process, step one, step two, step three, step four. They were unchanged. So Brady came up with the idea of photographing the Civil War when he saw that the country was going to go into war. And um, he wanted to document this war. And he made a proposal to Abraham Lincoln during a portrait session that he would wanted to photograph the war. Lincoln said, yes, but no, no government money. And Brady said he would then finance the cost of this field operation during the Civil War. And uh, what I really appreciate about Brady is his vision. This is the first American war that was ever recorded on film and that we have a visual record of. So Brady uh, set up several of these portable darkroom wagons hired a bunch of young men to do his photography. At the time, Brady's eyesight was failing. And uh, there's some controversy about Brady gets the, gets the credit for the photos, but a lot of them weren't taken by Brady. They were taken by his assistants. He was kind of the project manager, but I think he deserves the credit. All in all, Brady invested more than $100,000 of his own money in the project, which was a huge fortune at the time. I believe he hoped to recoup his cost from the sales of photos and never did. He, as I mentioned, he ultimately died at a, in a pauper's hospital. That's another story. Um, but Brady's photographs were brutally honest. It's the first time that American people had actually had a chance to see the ravages of war. Uh, This is one of his famous Civil War battlefield photos. And this is a group of men who lost limbs, legs, and arms, and, and were covering at a hospital in Washington, D.C. So he was, he was pull no punches, and he showed the war as well as he could for what it was, a terrible, brutal, bloody place. And uh, those photos are now uh, in the Smithsonian, almost all of them. Um, everything between the 1860s when Brady was photographing in the 1990s was mostly a refinement of the original technology. Cameras got smaller and lighter and used roll film, enabling a photographer to shoot a number of photos without having to change film. And in the mid-1970s, my wife Penny, who I mentioned was a kindergarten teacher but also was an early adopter of technology. She loved technology. She bought a Commodore computer and brought that into the house and it was a real novelty item and my children used that device to defend against space invaders and other digital menaces but the sounds of particle cannons and exploding alien ships 
were drowning out another sound, and that was the sound of the proverbial runaway freight train. That's the one that's belching smoke and fire and steam. And uh, it was bearing down on the traditional way of practicing both photography and print journalism. We were standing on the railroad tracks and didn't know it. The scenes of change in photo technology, this tectonic change in photo technology, were ironically planted by a young Eastman Kodak engineer who invented the world's very first but primitive and clumsy digital camera in 1975. It was about this big, it was heavy, and the image quality, you could barely tell that it was a photograph. So he suggested to his superiors that they might want to explore this technology and see if they could refine it. As you can imagine, this company that had made a fortune is one of the corporate giants in America said, we think this will threaten film. And they selected not to proceed. And they asked, basically, uh, this new development. Uh, they did nothing with it. But they did hold the patent. In January of 2012, Eastman Kodak, one of the corporate giants of American business, a company that at one time employed 75,000 people, regularly had annual sales exceeding a billion dollars, filed for bankruptcy protection. The company bet its existence on the continued use of silver-based film as the future of photography. But digital photography completely destroyed that business model in two decades. That same digital tsunami that engulfed and destroyed Eastman Kodak was also headed directly at print journalism. But before it hit, I would have to learn an entire new way of preparing photographs for publication and to discard the old skills I had spent so many years perfecting in the past. So in 1974, Macintosh computer was introduced, 1974. And it was the first piece in the digital transformation puzzle. It was a piece that could put all the electronic bits and pieces of a digital photo into a single seamless whole. And I'm going to see, uh, are any of you, how, how versed are you? I, I, so originally, film that recorded images was a silver-based medium. And it was the silver, actually, that captured the light that came through the, the lens. When we switched to digital, it went from, uh, it went to a, an electronic form of capture. It was a photoelectric rather than photochemical process. And I don't know, let me see if I can show you. I, I don't know if you're familiar how that process works. I just found it fascinating. I, 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 I never really understood how anybody Uh, could have imagined you could make a photograph out of little bits and pieces of rectangular electronic information. And uh, I just, just basically, I, uh, if I can get this. No. I don't know if that's. Well, what I try to do is just take uh, a, a, a section out of a photograph, but uh, not very successful. At any rate, oh, ah, okay, all right. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. At any rate, uh, the way I explain it, and what you're looking at there are pixels, and this is a pixelated image. And a digital photograph is composed of thousands and thousands of individual pixels, each one containing a small, tiny part of the image. 
The way I like to explain it is very similar to old Roman and Greek tile paintings, where you take a rectangular tile shape, and if you're going to paint an emperor on that, you'd start out and you'd one part of the tile would show maybe his eyebrow, and then the tile below that would show part of his eye, and the tile below that would show another part of his eye. And if you looked at each of those parts, they made no sense. But once they began then putting those tiles on a wall and put them together, all of a sudden you stood back and said, oh, yes, that's the emperor, or a picture, of, or, or, or a country scene. And that's essentially the same way that that digital photographs are, are put together. So it took a computer to be able to assemble all those parts. And it's initially done, uh, the assembly now is initially done, so when you, you take a digital photo, your camera has a built-in processor, and that process, processor begins to assemble that picture for you. And, uh, and then you can bring it into a computer, the computer completes that process, and then you can edit it. So I mentioned uh, the Macintosh computer. That was the first part of the puzzle. Um, the second part of the puzzle uh, came along in 1987, and that was when Photoshop was introduced. Photoshop was an electronic or digital editing application that allowed you to take a photograph uh, that had been uh, taken digitally, and you could change all those pixels. And what makes it so malleable is you can change any of those pixels in that photo. You can change a single pixel at a time if you want. You generally don't do that. But you can do that because you can just take it apart and put it back together. Um, it also allows a lot of mischief. Um, I was looking at uh, this, uh, I have, a, I have a picture up here that's, that's taken in Prague, Czechoslovakia, bla my, this big black and white picture here. And if I wanted, and I have another picture here over the Capitol building with the blossoms. If I wanted, uh, I could move, put this picture of this man walking across a bridge into, this, into the sky of this picture, or, or worse yet, uh, he has a briefcase in his hand. I could put something else in his hand. Uh, name what you want. If you have a photograph of the object you want to put in your hand, you can put it in his hand fairly easy in a digital application. And so everyone, photographers in, in particular, are always looking for perfection. We want the perfect photo. And it was real clear to me when I saw how you could edit with Photoshop, that you could move real quickly into perfection by removing things that you didn't like, you didn't want to be there, adding things that you wanted to be there, and um, changing colors, making pictures lighter. You could do all those things with a digital application. The problem was I was working for a newspaper. And the newspaper's biggest asset is not their printing press and not their personnel, it's their credibility. Real early on, when it became obvious what could be done with a digital photograph, uh, we had the discussion with editors that we were not to add or subtract anything from any of the photos that we published in the newspaper under pain of we'd be discharged, we'd be fired. I always agreed with that. I always thought that was the right policy. And um, that stayed, as far as I knew, I mean, that had not changed, and I'm sure that's still a policy today. That doesn't stop journalists from altering photographs to make them look the way they want. And to me, that's a slippery slope that has led to the situation we're in now with the accusations of false news. It's all about credibility. And that's a problem I can't solve, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a terribly important one, and I'm not sure how we're ever going to find an answer to that. We've gone down a road that is frightening to me.
Um, I'm sorry. Going on to, uh, so as, as digital technology moved into the newspaper, Statesman Journal bought their first, let me, let me go back just real quickly. So our reporters at Statesman Journal used to type on a typewriter, regular old Underwood typewriter. They would type their stories and they would send them off uh, where they would be then set and uh, for the offset press, it was a photographic process, but it, it had to go to a production department from a reporter to a production department. A lot of steps, a lot of labor, a lot of extra money for the paper to spend. So the Statesman Journal had been purchased by Gannett in 1973. Gannett had some money. Gannett was flush. The newspaper industry was flush. The newspaper industry was making a ton of money. They bought the first computer processors for stories. So instead of sitting down at an old Underwood typewriter, they'd sit down at a computer console, they type the story. Instead of sending the story then down to production to have them retype the story and set it in type, the type, uh, the story automatically went into a phototype that could be, and, and in the story form, could be cut, uh, laid onto a piece of paper, photographed, put on the press, and printed. So we eliminated. Lost and, and quite a few production people lost that job. That was just kind of an automated part of their uh, of of uh, the process. And for photographers at that time, we were still shooting film, but we were edging towards a digital process. And what we did was we had a scanner that would convert analog negative file negative to a digital file. And then we would use our Photoshop application to go ahead and pre-press that, get that ready uh, to, uh, to print. So the, the great advantage of the digital camera was obvious. Uh, obvious to anyone, the contents of a digital camera were available instantly rather than having to go through this long process of developing a negative, drying the negatives, putting the light negatives on a light table. That was a, a slow, cumbersome process. The early digital cameras, though, that were available were unreliable and the quality of the photos were very, quality of the photos were very poor. And in 1994, remember this is in the 70s when Eastman Kodak, remember our friends Eastman Kodak came out or invented the first digital camera. In 1994, Eastman Kodak, the Nikon camera company and the Associated Press collaborated on what was the, what would be the very first digital single lens reflex camera that produced a professionally acceptable image. And the price of that camera without a lens, just the body of the camera, was $17,950. But in a business that was driven by tight daily deadlines, uh, we wanted a camera. We wanted a digital camera. And when Nikon offered a digital camera for $6,000, the Statesman Journal purchased two digital cameras to share w by five photographers. And gradually, our old dark rooms were closed, and we made the complete transition to digital photography. I believe it's human nature to cling to the ways and skills that have taken us time to master over the years. We surrender those skills grudgingly and with much apprehension about the new skills that we must learn now to do the same job. I remember as I moved out of the chemical dark room and into the digital one, there was a whole new vocabulary to learn, new unfamiliar tools to use, and new procedures. The means of providing for my family was dependent on successfully making that transition. And I suspect a lot of you out here have gone through that same process. <laughs> it, was, it was a frightening one. Um, the challenge was simultaneously exciting and scary at the same time. There were times when I questioned my ability to understand a completely new way of doing my job. In retrospect, I had no idea of the ways in which this new technology would expand and improve uh, in some startling ways my ability to communicate with visual images. At the same time, the technology of photography was undergoing a tectonic shift 
changes were also being triggered in the newspaper industry. And I mentioned in the 60s and 70s and 80s and into the 90s, newspapers were, they, they used to joke about a printing press was actually a press for printing money. And newspapers were just kind of a side. And the Statesman Journal is no exception. And Gannett was making a ton of money. The future of print journalism looked bright. Most newspapers had an almost monopolistic control over the production and distribution of news, and advertisers had few options for their advertising dollars. But as computers became more effective at sharing information, the print, journalism's, uh, print journalism monopoly was gradually eroded, and revenue began a steady decline that continues to this day. In an effort to reduce production costs, newspapers began to reduce the size of their workforce, and I was offered a buyout in December of 2001, and I accepted. I walked out the door of the Statesman Journal for the last time with feelings of regret, envy, and doubt. Regret because I was leaving a job I truly loved and had mastered. Envy because my colleagues were going to enjoy the fruits of this new technology which is a great way of telling stories. I used to, I used to envy sometimes my friends in, the, in electronic media. When I was telling a story, I had to do it with a single photo, and I had to do it without sound. So I was missing some of the really important, and some of the stories cried out for sound or motion. And I used to think they were so lucky to be able to tell their story with a thousand images that moved and had sound, and I had to tell mine with just one. And as I looked at the, the coming of the digital camera, it hadn't happened when I left, but gradually, the cameras, and of course you all have them now, the cameras, digital cameras, are able to shoot both stills, high quality stills, and high quality video. And I always thought, what a wonderful way all of a sudden to be able to do that. And, and I would be able to put that on a website so I'd be able to share those pictures electronically. It seemed like a really exciting prospect. And I mentioned the doubt because it was hard to imagine how I would replace the challenge and excitement and frequent adrenaline rush that came with the job that I was leaving. However, by the time of my retirement, I had mastered the hardware and software of digital photography. I had learned to shoot and edit digital video, and I began work on, the, on a documentary video uh, of the uh, restoration of the aging and beautiful Elsinore Theater in downtown Salem. Even though I was living on a retirement income, digital allowed me to shoot as much as I wanted without constantly worrying about the cost of film and developing, and I no longer had the frustration of dealing with editors and their arbitration, their, their arbitrary decision making about my photographs. Retirement was quickly becoming a lot more fun than I thought it was ever going to be. How are we doing for time? I know we're going to... Is this time? Before I go on any further, I don't know, um, to, to this point, I am, I am now retired. I've left the Statesman Journal, and my life all of a sudden has just really taken a turn for much better than I thought it would. Uh, can I answer any questions? Anybody have any questions about anything that I've, I've mentioned on the... Oh. This on? Uh, up here. Okay. Yeah, this is Bob. Um, I, I have, I guess, more of a comment than a question about something you just said. I think you may be selling yourself a little bit short with the comment about film versus a photograph. Mm -hmm. I mean, film is, is obviously wonderful. I'm not, yes. not questioning that. But 
if you think about some of the single iconic images of, of a single photograph, I think they can produce perhaps a more profound effect um, because the viewer can, you know, focus on that one image. Um, like mm, thank your, you. Yes. your photo there from, from Prague. I mean, I've been looking at that and, and all kinds of things are going through my mind about it. Or say, you know, uh, uh, Doroth Dorothea Lange's photo of the... The, the immigrant mother. Yeah. Yes. Or, or mm. Matthew Brady, you know, the, the sharpshooter, uh, even though it was staged. But, um, or the, the police chief in Saigon that, mm -hmm. you know, was ex that, that yeah. single Those image. Those single iconic images that stay burned in your memory. Those are the kind of things that you yeah, remember. Yeah, and, and I, th I think I, they could I be much more you. profound I, I just than I, a I video. I frequently fall victim to the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And how lucky <laughs> these guys are to be able to tell their story with... with uh, multiple images and sound and, and movement. Yes, sir. My name is Bob. You've been talking a lot about the technology and how it changed, but would you uh, share a little bit about who, the, the choice of angle in, a, in an image, where, where the photographer stands relative to what they're shooting and the cropping? Somebody's doing some, making decisions about that, and was it you or somebody else? No, no, and, and that is, that is, one of the art, photography is both an art and a craft, and I, I, I think where you position yourself, I call that the point of view. The point of view is where the camera and the lens is at the moment you make your exposure, and that is absolutely critical. And what a photographer is always trying to do, and what I'm always looking at when I would go out on assignment is, as soon as I would get there, I would start looking around for, first of all, what's the story I'm here to tell? How can I best tell that? Again, with a single image, and I always thought, I mentioned my friends in the electronic media. They would come and they'd stand in one place and they'd stand and they'd machine gun and they'd machine gun and they'd machine gun and machine gun and they'd go back and quite often the story I thought was really interesting, looked pretty dull. They had a lot of images and had a lot of motion and had sound to go with it, but I thought they missed the essence of that story. I had to be able to tell my story in one photograph. And in order to do that, I had to find the spot to stand and the place where my camera and lens were going to be placed before I pushed the button. And uh, I did a lot of that and I got really good at it. Just things you learn from experience. But there are several things I would do. One of the things I would do is, is uh, if, 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 if I were in a crowd, one of the first things you do is find the high ground because you want to see what's going on in the crowd. And I've done a lot of things, rallies, protests, and other things. And uh, if you're eye level with a crowd, about all you see is the first person in front of you. And so those are just things that you kind of do instinctively. It, 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 you've been in the business, but it, they, they become ingrained and they just become uh, a, a part of the way you think when you're approaching a photograph. And I do that with my landscape photos. Since I've retired, I've just done primarily landscape. I'm going to talk in the second half, as soon as the break, I'm going to talk a little bit about another thing that allows me an extraordinary point of view, and that is the use of my drones with the flying camera. And that has given me a point of view that I could only imagine. And I did think about that. So, um, but yes, the very first thing I think you do when you, when you go anywhere is you think about where do I want to stand? And that's, that, the photographer makes that determination. Did that answer your question? Oh, and, and cropping, what we picked out of a, out of a photo. Uh, I, I mentioned how frustrating it was to deal with editors. I hope there are no editors here. I didn't. I, uh, so I mentioned when we were first on film, uh, we would develop a film, bring it in, put it on a light table, and then recall the editors. The editors would come down, and our rolls of film, 36 exposure rolls of film, were spread out on the table, and we would look at those with a magnifying glass. I would mark a few that I suggested were probably the best out of the bunch to save the editors some time. But I had some editors come down and respect my 
judgment. I had others who come down and think, you know, <laughs> who is this guy? I know a lot more about photography than he does. And they would look at my whole take. And then they would inevitably pick out what I thought was the weakest photo out of the whole. <laughs> but uh, the, pho uh, the photo editor, or the editor came down and looked at that. They made the final decision about what photo went in that was published in the newspaper. And if I needed to crop, crop something out of that photo, they made that decision also. Hi, this is Vicki. Hi, Vicki. I, um, I have a granddaughter who's interested in photojournalism. I'm wondering what you think the future of photojournalism is. Oh, that's, that's, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I wish I could be more encouraging. I, y I, I told you when I came, I said, I thought I had the best job in the world, and I still think it was. I loved it, and I still love getting out and taking photos with the camera. I get excited every time I do it. I just, I've been so sad by what's happened to, to the business of photojournalists, excuse me. I think it's an important, important, the whole, the whole process, the print industry, print journalism industry, and photojournalism as well, are so important to the health of communities and I think to the, to the health of this country. And to see them gutted the way they have been, I, I don't know, I, excuse me, I gotta take a drink. <laughs> I don't know. I I can understand why your daughter wants or your your is granddaughter granddaughter wants to pursue that. I would if I were her. I don't know how she's going to be able to do that under current circumstances. And I and I don't know how you're going to have the really competent journalists, the ones who bring back those iconic images, the ones that we remember, and the ones that change us. without some experience. And they're getting cut off in newspapers, right and left. Um, and I don't know where they go to practice and learn the skills that they need to be really good at what they're doing. I'm glad there are young people who are still interested. And they can share their images online. and. I'm sure young people are much, much better at that, using that technology than I am. I'm not very good at it. But there are ways to share their images, and, and there are ways to use your photos to make a difference and to communicate with other people. I just am not sure that the newspapers, and they used to be, they used to be the great entryway for the photojournalists who, like I say, made the iconic images. I, I, I wouldn't discourage her. But I just, in my own mind, I don't know. I don't know where she's going to find the way to practice that skill. Yes. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Um, this is Becky, and I had a question. How was the decision made? You talked about this a little to pair a photograph with text. Oh, I'm sorry. Could you say that? How one do more? you decide what photo goes along with what text? How does the photo get? ultimately combined with the story? Um, that is, again, is, is the decision of the editors. And my job as a photographer was to go out, be at the scene, uh, get my photos, get back by deadline, by the way. And, and it's fascinating. One of the fascinating things about newspaper, and it really kept you on your toes, is our deadline was daily. Every day, I came in, in the morning, and I knew that I had a deadline. I had photos that I had to get to the news desk by a certain time of day. And, um, but uh, that was as far as it went. And I had editors, and like I say, again, editors are the bane of my existence. Some of them I, I really liked and respected, but they drove me crazy some days. And they made the final decision about what newspapers or what pictures went with what stories. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, the editors made the decisions about what photos we were going to shoot, except, and, and this is just off, off shot of, uh, at the Statesman Journal and in Salem, you know Salem is still a nice, quiet town. I mean, it's changed a lot since, since I was working at the newspaper, and maybe it's gotten a little more excited. I'm not sure, but we published a newspaper seven days a week, and we had to have a front page picture seven days a week without exception. And we had to have it by the deadline. And so oftentimes, if we had no, no picture and no story that was going to make a page one story, the editor say, we need you to go out and find something. And I would grab the camera, grab my camera, get in my car, and drive. First of all, I go to the parks, and I start looking at the obvious places, and then just drive around looking here and there, uh, looking for what we call an enterprise photo. And I always loved doing those because I always felt like I was out seeing what was happening in the community while the rest of you are at work, earning money to pay for your subscriptions <laughs> and, and pay my salary. But uh, I, I, let me just, so one of my favorite pictures that turned out from Enterprise uh, assignment was uh, down uh, near the Marion Street Bridge and by what is now Riverfront Park, you know, a railroad track runs through there. And at one time, there still used to be a little small wooden, old f wood frame railroad depot. And I was down walking around. I thought, maybe I'll find something down here. And all of a sudden, out from underneath the railroad depot came a kitten. And I think from a litter of kittens. It's probably been born. But anyway, th the kitten started walking out from the railroad depot and stood on the railroad track and started walking down the railroad track. I took my camera, and this is the point of view thing also that I was talking about. I laid the camera down flat on the railroad track. So I had a view of the railroad track. And it, of course, as it's closer to the camera, it's big, and then it gets smaller as it recedes in the distance. As this cat walked towards me, it has a little tail sticking straight up behind it. And it walked towards the camera. I shot a series of photos of that cat. Went back and showed that to the editors. They loved it. It was our page one picture the next day. And I also sent it out to Associated Press. Associated Press then sent it out to uh, their international distribution. Long story short, for months afterwards, we would get inquiries about, uh, and, uh, about uh, did the cat have enough food? Uh, <laughs> Could they make a contribution? <laughs> to, to and, and that went on for quite a long time. It just, but anyway, we we did a lot of that. We just went out and simply looked for photos and 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 found them, and that was a fun fun part of the job. Yeah, um, my name is uh, David. Uh, I talked to you a little earlier. Uh, were the first photographs really? Uh, the ones that came to people's attention uh, made during the Crimean War in the 1850s, because yes. I, I remember seeing those, and uh, I think that was a really important time in photography. Yes, they are. Yeah, he was, he was quite right. The first, <coughs> actually, the first use of a, of a uh, camera to record a battlefield was done in the Crimean War, and that was done by a photographer named Roger Fenton. And uh, so... It wasn't that Brady was the first to do that, he, but he was the first to do to record an American conflict, and and uh, Fenton's photos are actually quite fascinating to look at. You you know anything's available on the internet if you're interested. Look up Brady and, and some of his photos, and then Roger Fenton too, and some of the, the battlefields. One one of Fenton's famous photos of a battlefield is you look up uh, up a hillside that's kind of denuded of vegetation, and you see little round things everywhere all over. Those round things are cannonballs. So it's, it, the battle has, those are, uh, are projectiles of fire during the, during the, uh, during a, uh, a battle there. Ron, it's probably time to take a break right? now. Let's so take a break. Minutes. Welcome back. I'm pleased that uh, so many of you decided to return. <laughs> <clears throat> And let me apologize. I had not intended to get quite so emotional when I started talking about journalism and and the future. That and 
I, I forgot your name, but you know, I, I, I paint a dismal picture <laughs> of, the, of the future for young people in, in photojournalism, and, and it's probably not an accurate uh, representation of what the future might be like. I just, I just thought that the newspaper is such a, a wonderful way to acquire the discipline and the, the, and, and just learn a business. And uh, and I don't I don't know how young people are going to get that. I think they'll maybe they'll get that on their own. There are a lot of and there there are so many more ways of sharing images than ever there were. I mean, when the newspaper was it. And I remember I used to go out sometimes. I'd shoot three thirty six exposure rolls and I'd bring them back to the editor. I say, look, I've got this picture and this picture and this picture, and I'd say, great, we got room for one. <laughs> and now, you know, online. You can, you can go to the Statesman Journal, and if they have an event, a parade, or a rally, or something, you can go back and you can look at all the pictures that they've taken, if you want, or at least several of them. So there are ways to do that. I guess, I guess maybe they just have to be more determined than I was to make that happen. And then, you know, I, I, I don't know, I subscribe digitally to several national newspapers. And I, I do that because A, I want to be informed, B, I want to support those organizations. I want them to stay in existence and keep publishing the news because I think they're very important. Um, I mentioned somebody up here earlier that I said, and I'm not a prophet, I'm a really bad prophet, but every once in a while, I, I, I've looked at the recent cuts the Statesman Journal made, including some people who have been there when I was working there, and I thought they were really confident, good people, and they've lost their jobs. I would be surprised, frankly, if the Statesman Journal exists as a printed publication in 2020. And I don't know, uh, I, I think you'll be able to get that digitally. That's good. I subscribe to the, the newspaper digitally. I'm not, a lot of times, really too impressed with the quality of it, I'm sorry to say. Um, but at least you do get some local news. And if the, if the Statesman Journal were to go away, I don't know what you would replace that with. I don't know how you would have a narrative of who Salem is as a community. But I don't have those answers. Um, so uh, let's go on to a brighter subject. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop weeping for the. <laughs> One of the lovely things about the switch to new technology is uh, <clears throat> the ability to print images that I had taken. So when I worked in an analog dark room, it was a chemical dark room, worked with uh, the size of the prints that I could make, and by the way, I printed only black and white, were limited by the size of the trays and the sink that I had to work in. So more often than not, I made an 8 by 10 black and white print. But if I want to make a bigger print, I get an 11 by 14 tray, fill it with the proper solutions, and I can make an 11 by 14 print. And that's about this size. If I really had something I wanted, I could do 16 by 20, sometimes 20 by 24. But then you're looking at trays this big, and it really takes a lot of time to set up a lot of chemicals. And so 20 by 24 was roughly the biggest print that I could do, and I didn't do that very often. With, when digital came along, and they began to make good digital printers, they printed instead of on a single sheet of paper, they printed off of roll of paper. And that meant that as big as I could make a, a photo or a, a file, I could ask them, let's make that six feet by four. Huge, gigantic photos. And I love being able to make my images that big. Um, some of my big, big photos are still in Salem Hospital, especially in the outpatient clinic. They were the really early ones. They had asked me if I would do some photos for that building. I, I, I mentioned my wife, Penny, uh, who died of cancer, had been treated at Salem Hospital. And I said, I, she, I, I'm so appreciative of the care that she got there. I'd let me donate some photos to the hospital. And uh, they were thinking in terms of photo prints that would be uh, matted and framed. And when they began looking at the cost of matting and framing, the cost of matting and framing just about took up their whole budget. And I said, 
you know, I don't think we need to mat and frame these, but I said what we need to do is think in different terms instead of a little 8 by 10 mat and frame picture on a wall that's 70 feet long and, and 14 feet. They, they just get lost. Let's, let's get some big photos, something that's going to carry some visual weight. And we were able to do that with a printer here in town that I worked with, and, and those are the first big photos that I printed. And uh, from there, I developed a kind of a side interest in, I, I did mostly landscape. I stopped shooting house fires and car wrecks. And uh, doing mostly landscapes that I could do at my leisure. Instead of having a deadline, I could go out in the morning before sunrise to a church out, an old wooden church out in Spring Valley, wait till the sun comes up, take my picture. And I, I was not at the mercy of, of photo editors. I was the person responsible for making all those decisions, and it was it was wonderful. So I I, I mentioned uh, I did a lot of landscape photos and began getting calls from people who wanted Salem area photos to decorate their businesses. So I now have them in doctors' offices, some dentist offices, um, some banks, and um, it, it it's just been it's it's been a fun way for me to find a home for my photos. I take a lot of photos. I see photos all the time. I saw photos when I was driving down here this morning. The ground was covered with frost. I looked at it, oh my gosh. There's some great photos out here and they're going to waste. <laughs> well, I kept on driving and here I am. But one of the most exciting new photo technologies, in my personal opinion, to come along in a long time has been the introduction of the photo drone. And the drones have gotten a bad rap, and you see them there in the news pretty regularly now. Um, but I bought my first drone about three years ago. I've got a friend of mine sitting up here in the far back corner of the auditorium, John Svensson. John was a little braver than I was. The drones are a little bit expensive and I couldn't see investing a thousand dollars in a camera that I wasn't sure was going to take a decent photo. But John had done that and when he showed me his first photograph I thought, my gosh, the quality of these is just amazing. And I went ahead and then bought my first drone and started learning to fly that. And um, I was not, I, not accustomed to flying cameras. <laughs> and I, John has had his drone for three years, and I don't believe, I don't think he's crashed it once. I, on the other hand, have crashed mine three different times. I've destroyed two of them. That's just, that's just the cost of doing business. And when you have something that you, you're not attached to by anything but radio signals, and you send that out, and it's 500 yards away from you and 300 feet in the air, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the odds of, of losing that and not getting it back home are, are high. And the early technology, the technology has gotten better and better and better every year. And... Uh, I have better control. It used to be when I first started flying a drone that you'd put it up and you'd watch it out there and suddenly uh, they navigate by geosynchronous satellites. And I, when you fly them out, you can give them a waypoint. And that's when you start looking at your, your iPad to compose your photo. And that drone is supposed to stay right there and if there's a breeze that comes up, moves it, it'll automatically go back to that same spot that you set for it. And just hover the same elevation, same spot. You can compose your picture and take your picture, but periodically, in the early technology, I would give it a waypoint and I start looking and then look back up my drone. It's, <laughs> it's a frightening feeling. <laughs> the drones, and you may have noticed, uh, have been in the news a lot lately. Um, probably read about the one that reported drone sighting at Gatwick. And what, what is amazing about that is I, I spent my last three years, I, f I find them to be the most amazing photographic tool. And 
the most amazing piece of just technology. And I love my drone, and I try to, I, I try to educate, and if, if I'm flying and somebody comes and wants to look at it, I'm always happy to have them take a look. But um, the drone, the Gatwick incident at Gatwick Airport, they said that they canceled 1,000 flights during Christmas holidays. 14,000 travelers were affected, and EasyJet, a European air carrier, claims to have lost $19 million. So what's interesting about that episode with the, with the drones is that they sent out huge numbers of policemen from London. They eventually brought in the British military to try to find who was flying the drone. They never did. There's no evidence. No one has any photos, which is unusual. No one has any damaged drones that crashed on the runway at Gatwick, or they arrested two people mistakenly. <laughs> and their, their names were splashed all over the, the, the London tabloids as, as the people who had been flying the drone, and they were eventually determined that they were innocent. At any rate, uh, it's all a part of, of, of what I call technophobia. And, uh, it, it, it ties in, again, nicely with uh, a bit of photo history that I think you'll find interesting. And it's just the kind of way people react to new technology. In um, 18, I believe it was 1880s, late 1800s, George Eastman, you recognize that name, Eastman Kodak, developed a roll film camera, and I mentioned to you up, to, up that time, your photos were taken one at a time. He developed an, a, an emulsion that you could coat with the light sensitive material, put into a roll, and it would allow people then to take multiple photos. And he also developed a camera that was much smaller than the big studio stationary cameras. And people began buying that. What that allowed them to do was then to take that camera, go outside, and take pictures outside. And you could do that before with the big old studio cameras, but like say one at a time. It was so this kind of opened up new uh, possibilities for people who didn't have the big studio cameras. And what you would do is you would buy that camera from George Eastman. You'd take I think maybe ten or fifteen photos on it. You'd send the camera back to the company. They would take the film out, develop the film, make prints, put a new roll of film in, and send the camera back. And he picked the name Kodak. The name Kodak doesn't mean anything. It's, it's a random selection. He liked the letters K, and he thought Kodak would be a word that would be easy to pr pronounce, and people wouldn't forget it. And so this camera was called a Kodak. But suddenly, there are people appearing on the streets of New York City and Philadelphia and a lot of the major eastern cities with these cameras taking pictures of people in the streets and just random pictures of whoever they thought were interested or, or what scenes they thought were interesting. And so people's imagination began working, as people's imaginations will. And pretty soon, there were signs that would appear on beaches. Big signs that would say, Kodaks, not allowed on this beach. It, people were imagining that uh, you'd have <coughs> these perverts with these devices that would take pictures of people in swimming suits. And uh, <laughs> so people are real quick to, to step right up and, and make sure that our morals are, are well protected. And, and uh, then there were newspapers that actually editorialized about how dangerous and who, know, who, who knew what might happen when more and more people got cameras and more and more people started taking photographs. And the same kind of techno paranoia, I think, is, is afflicting uh, drones to this day. Um, they're, like I say, they're remarkable. Uh, 
in their technology and remarkable what they can do. Uh, there have been some drones that have flown several thousand feet, which is a violation of FAA rules. The Federal Aviation Administration controls the airspace over the United States, and they determine who can fly there and how you can fly there. So for drones, they have regulations for drones, and the basic regulations are, one, you can't fly above 400 feet, and you're not to fly over crowds of people, you're not to fly beyond what they call visual line of sight. In other words, when I'm flying my drone, I have to be able to see it. And I, I can't get it so far away that I can't see it. People do that all the time, but it is a violation of FAA rules. There are sensible rules. The other is you can't fly within a mile of, depending on certain airports. There's a five mile exclusion around the big airports. So 500, 400 feet, uh, five-mile exclusion. Uh, if, and the software has been developed so well that if I'm flying, I, I went down, I'm going to show you some of this picture a little bit, I went down with my friend John uh, Tuesday after we had the snow, and I thought, you know, there ought to be some really nice photos for a drone. We did a couple of things, went down eventually down to Deepwood, and we got down to Deepwood, and Deepwood is fairly close, actually, as a crow flies, to Salem Airport. I have software, and when I went to launch my drone, I got a warning. It said, you are close to an airport. Uh, and it also warned me that uh, my flight controls might be affected. But what I had to do is I had to check off. I, I, I understand that I am close to this airport, and I accept responsibility for flying here. If I were a little bit closer, I couldn't launch. Uh, the software uses, uh, again, geosynchronous satellites. It knows exactly where my craft is in relation to the airport. And if I get a little bit closer than, than Deepwood, and I put my quadcopter on the ground and try to fly it, I can't launch. It will not raise up off the ground. Those are all really sensible technologies that make it a lot safer. There are people who pay no attention to that, and uh, they're the ones who, who give uh, responsible drone flyers a black eye. I want to talk, I'm going to show you just a little real quickly uh, two of the drones I've got here. And at the end, if you have time, you want to come up, take a look. You're welcome to come and take a look. So I brought two today. This is the first one that I bought. This is the drone, has four, the reason they're called quadcopters, they have four props on arms that extend out from the body. This is the camera. It's on a gimbal. When I launch this craft, I can raise up the landing gear or the skids on that to get them out of the view of the camera. The camera, I, I, I can I have a controller. I'm going to bring this up. Okay. Bring this up. This is the controller I use. It has joysticks in it like a computer game. And it has a pad, or you can do this with an iPhone. I use mine with a pad. When I launch this, Everything my camera sees, I can see on my pad in real time. So I can launch this, I can put it up, I can move it to where I think I want to make my point of view, and then I can stop it, I can compose my photo, I can take a photo, or I can take high quality video. This tiny little camera uh, is able to take high quality video, and I'm going to just show you some of the still images, first of all, that I have taken uh, with, this, with this device. And, uh, oh, but I want to show you the second drone and show you how drone technology has come in the last three years. So this is my new drone, half the size, half the weight. Uh, in addition, it looks, these arms fold.
So I could, it's very compact when you fold it down, easy to carry. I actually took this on a plane to Sedona, Arizona, and took some pictures down in Sedona at one time. Well, what's interesting about the new technology as it gets better is that these two little things here look like bug eyes in the front. They're sensors. And there are two in the front, two in the side, two on the bottom, and one at the back. Photographers get distracted easily. And the thing I love about the new technology is, as a matter of fact, that's the way I lost one of these big drones, the big white ones. I say lost, I like ran it into a tree. But um, the smaller drone with the sensors, if I get distracted and that drone is flying at Grant here in the front row, it will reach about six feet and the sensors will, first of all, set off an alarm on my pad, a visual alarm and a flashing light. And then real soon afterwards, it will stop automatically without any input from me. So that prevents it from flying into a person or into a tree or into a building or whatever else might be in the way. It's, uh, again, it, it's, uh, you know, the technology gets better, they get safer to fly, and uh, the control technology is better. I've never had a fly away or any kind of an issue of control with this new little small drone that I have. Um, is it possible to dim the lights just a little bit? I'm going to... Oh, the what? I'm going to show you some pictures with the drone. They are remarkable. I think. my Mac. Not there. Okay, here we go. I got, I got, I know, I see what I'm doing. Oh, hang on. I don't know if you recognize that scene, but this was done on Tuesday, Tuesday morning. My friend John and I got up before daybreak. We knew there was snow on the ground, and we went down the West Salem boat ramp. It, it, it's just extraordinary. And, but it, again, it gives you a point of view, a way of looking at a place I've lived here now since, like, say, 1969. Some of you probably lived here a lot longer than I have. But it just gives you a brand new way of looking at this place where you've lived all this time. It's just a remarkable point of view. You recognize that object up there in the <laughs> upper right hand corner? <laughs> Take a selfie. Yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> so I got my first drone about the same time they began construction on the Mento Island Peter Courtney Bridge. And I am a little obsessive compulsive. And I, I thought, you know, I don't do this for the newspaper anymore, but somehow this is, this is going to be an iconic part of Salem. And I'd like to get some photos of it as it's being constructed. I'm going to show you one of those here in a little bit. But uh, how am I going to do that? The construction site was dangerous. I'm not official anymore. I'm just a retired old guy with a camera. And um, how can I get my photos of the bridge construction? And it occurred to me that one of the best things to use for that would be a drone. I could stand in the park. I could stand in a place in the park where I'm quite safe, fly it out over the construction site, take my photos of the construction, and bring my drone back, land it, and I've got the photos. And so I've 
photograph that. I have construction photos from the bridge from the time before it first got started all the way to the end. But it also is a wonderful platform for taking a picture of this, uh, the setting. I think Riverfront Park is a wonder and uh, the bridge is beautiful. That globe is, is remarkable and again, uh, a photographer always looking for a point of view. How can I include all these things, the river, the globe, the bridge in one single photo? And the drone is the answer to that question. Is recognized downtown Salem, but it's again a, a a view that we don't often get. I uh, during my career at Statesman Journal, I did a lot of aerial fo uh, aerial photos, and I've taken photos from just about everything that flies. I've done light airplanes, uh, I've flown in helicopters, military helicopters, blimps, hot air balloons, and uh, this is this is by far the best aerial platform photography that that I know of. Um, if you do a light plane, light planes move at 80 miles an hour just to stay in the air. And so you're poking your camera out the window and hoping that you get your shot. The drone, you can just park it in the air. You can park it in the sky, compose your photo, and take your pictures. And helicopters, you can stop a helicopter. That's handy. But helicopters, I've rented just twice in my lifetime. Once after I retired, I did this for a commercial job. And the helicopter is $700 an hour. So you don't dawdle with the. Uh... That's just another view, just a different, just by placing the drone in a different spot in the sky, and then composing picture, and at a different time of year. That was in the fall, so. This is a panoramic photo of this campus. And that, that's, that's the other thing I forgot to mention about one of the great things about digital photography is there are all kinds of smart people who are developing new software to solve problems. And uh, a lot of times, I couldn't get everything in a photo that I wanted. My lens just wasn't wide enough. So eventually, somebody came up with a software solution to that problem, which allowed you to shoot a photo overlap that photo with the next one overlap. And you're all familiar with those. Probably a lot of you have done those with your iPhones. And uh, stitches them all together into seamless whole. But this is one of the most beautiful nights. Every time I look at this photo, I remember how extraordinarily beautiful that night was. And the photo reflects it. It was in the fall, one of those fall nights, windless night, temperatures probably in the 70s. And uh, anyway. It, I, I just love this picture. And again, there's no other way to do it. I mentioned to you, I'm always looking for photos in my mind. My mind's always working. I saw, I told you when I drove across the bridge from West Salem today, I thought, there are a lot of good pictures out there. And if I just stopped for a few minutes, I could be late to my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to drive around town when I worked for the newspaper. And I kept thinking, the gold man was always intriguing to me. I always had a place in my imagination. And I always thought, I'd love to be able to get up there and see Salem from his point of view, what he sees from his elevation. Or I'd love to be able to get up and get a picture of him. He's an icon of Salem with another icon, which is Waller Hall on the Willamette campus. But of course, there's no way to do that until the drone came along. And uh, you can't do this anymore. The, the uh, Capitol building now is off limits. And I knew that was going to happen, but uh, we got up early, and, and I've got my photos, and, and uh, that's history. <laughs>
real quickly, I want to show you um, This is a video that was done with the drones. This is the Rotary Triathlon, the start of the Rotary Triathlon. Again, it was just a beautiful, beautiful fall day. And uh, if I, I don't see, you can't watch this. And if, if you lived outside of Salem, say, I've got to go to that place. So at any rate, uh, the drone is, is hovering up over these trees, getting the start of the race. And again, this is the kind of control you have. You're shooting video. So the last contestant comes by, and we turn the drone, rotate it. And then we've got a tree in front of us that's starting to shut out our view of the runners. You just take it up until you can see the runners. And then all of a sudden, you can see that Willamette slough back there that's like a mirror. But the runners are now passed us by, except there are those big dangerous trees out there. Here's another one. <laughs> these, these big cottonwoods. Uh, I told you I've had some really unhappy experiences with, with trees. Well, I missed this one though. <laughs> But you can continue to track a group moving like this. And then you got to make a right-hand turn. What's that? And your station. Yes. Yes. I've never, never moved from where I started. Far away from you. As far as you have radio transmission, I have seen people who have flown drones. Again, this is a violation of FAA regulations, but I've seen people who have flown drones from two and a half miles away. You get that information, by the way, on your remote control. My remote control on my pad tells me how far away the drone is from the camera. It'll tell me you're 2,000 feet and you're at 300 feet elevation. And it also tells me how much battery I have left. This is part of the construction of the bridge. They had just gotten in some great big huge prefabricated slabs that were going to be the foundation of the walkway for the bridge. And they were putting those in that day. And so uh, we flew the drone. Uh, this would be south of the bridge construction. And uh, started doing this video of, of them installing the, uh, those slabs. Oh, I love being able to see my images this big. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the way, right there, those are the arches that you see. This, this blossom uh, explosion every spring 
just I can't resist it. And and to be able to again, this was done before uh, you you couldn't fly over the Capitol building, but. Uh, So there aren't very many hazards up there, but the one thing you got to watch out for, don't want to run in to the golden man. <laughs> and then you notice I, I moved the camera up a little bit. You can do that. Uh, you can move your camera up and down. You can, you can move it 360 degrees. Uh, You've got just a lot of options. Oh, and right here, you see that drone that flew back through there? That was my friend John. <laughs> he, he had his drone up at the same time. ahead and bring the lights back up. I'm just going to talk one other thing about technology and photography. And I probably couldn't tell you in strong enough terms how skeptical I was when I first heard that someone was going to put a phone or a camera on a phone. <laughs> and I thought, who would ever buy a phone with a camera on it? <laughs> I, I, I do a little investment constantly. If you have some retirement funds, you want to. <laughs> but there's an old saying in photography, the best camera you own is the one you have when you need it. And Everybody has a phone with them. I've got a phone with me here. Someplace I was <laughs> almost thinking about doing a selfie of, with, the, with, with all of you. And, um, there's a reliable estimate that says that 1.2 trillion photos were taken in 2018, and a million of those each day were selfies. The early quality of the cell phone cameras was dismal, but they kept getting better and better, and now cell phone manufacturers are promoting the quality of their camera over the functionality of the phone itself. Lenses have gotten much better, and there's intense competition among manufacturers pr to produce the best camera on a phone. You notice when they do their advertising, they talk about, look, here's the photos taken with a new iPhone. Huh? Even I must admit, and I have seen some very, very good photos taken with cell phones and devices. And right now, if you want, you would probably go to the Apple website. Apple is having a worldwide photo competition for the best photo taken with an iPhone. I admit that I've used an iPhone or a phone camera in a pinch, and I was quite satisfied with the results. There's an inherent risk in taking a selfie, though. A facial plastic surgeon in New Jersey noticed an alarming pattern in his office. He would have his patients come into the office, they talk, they pull their pocket, and they pull their cell phone out and say, Doc, look how big my nose is. <laughs> is there anything you can do? <laughs> so he teamed up with researchers at Rutgers University in Stanford to develop a mathematical model that could measure the optical distortion of selfie cameras. So selfies, the camera's about this far away from your face. A selfie photo taken from less than two feet away compared to a photo taken from five feet away causes the nasal base to appear 30% wider. The good news is that selfie subjects are not doomed to big noses and unusually large ears. Photo retouching software has come to the rescue. The 
software has an algorithm that eliminates the fish eye distortion and restores your beautiful face back to normal. No plastic surgery required. <laughs> Other offshoots of the digital revolution include body cameras, the use of body cameras on policemen, and the closed circuit uh, security television system. There are an estimated 350 million closed circuit security cameras in operation around the world, mostly used for crime prevention, but their use for general surveillance uh, for general surveillance is very lightly regulated. And I suspect that most of you here today have been photographed by one or more CCTVs since you got up. I don't know if Willamette has them here. I'm guessing they do. Uh, but if you've been to the Safeway store, you've definitely been on one. You went to the bank? Absolutely. I'm a born optimist, and I despite the news that I read every day. I believe the future of photography is a bright and constantly changing one. The one thing I would never attempt to do is to predict the next big technological leap in photography. I appreciate you coming out and staying with me for, <laughs> thank you. Questions? Is this on? Ron. Yes. The obvious question <coughs> for someone who isn't here or wanted to say hello is the, uh, how can we share some of those, uh, <coughs> let's say, still photos. Uh, <laughs> so amazing. Is there a way or are they hidden away? That's, that's a lovely question, and there should be a way. But I, I, don't, uh, I don't post them. I have a website that's 10 years old. I've not changed it in 10 years. And my problem is, just the same with organizing my photos. I take so many photos. My son is horrified when he comes home and looks at my desktop. I just pile photos on there by the thousands. I would much rather go out and shoot than sit down and organize them and edit them in any kind of a way that I could go back and find them. I lose photos constantly. Somebody say, would well, you have a photo of this? Well, I, 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 I took one, <laughs> but I don't know where it is. And, uh, and then you know, to go back and, and put these on a website, I just don't do that. And it's just partly because I thought when I retired I'd have all the time in the world to do all these things. <laughs> I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and all of a sudden it's dark and time to go to bed. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I still have to, I, I thought I wouldn't have to be as careful about how I spend my time, and now I am. So um, anyway, no, there isn't a way. <laughs> And, and I'm sorry, I, because I, I, I would, and I, I should stop and do that, because I think people would be interested. <laughs> yes. Ron, actually, right next door. I don't know how this ended up. Originally, I was going to ask you about some of the ethical or considerations of flying a drone because I'm so irritated when they're flying sure. over private space. But sure. that was original. Yeah. Having seen your still photographs, particularly from the drone, we can forget that question. <laughs> My question is the colors especially your early morning, evening mm -hmm. colors, when colors are so beautifully saturated and yes. intense. Yes. Uh, they're just so stunning and so painterly that I am curious as to any editing enhancement sort of process. Yes. Let me say, I, I understand, <clears throat> first of all, going back to the privacy. Privacy is an issue, and it does bother people to have a f camera flying overhead, and you don't know what they're photographing. Um, as a general rule, <clears throat> when I get a, my drone up to altitude, if I were to take a picture of somebody you knew well on the ground, you wouldn't recognize them. That's the that's good part of it. Uh, that's going to change, too. As photo technology improves, they'll have telephoto lenses, zoom lenses, and things that... <clears throat> so, again, you know, you, it, it depends on who's flying 
the craft and what kind of ethical decisions they're going to make about how they're going to use it. And about the colors, I edit my photography heavily. I mentioned I couldn't do a lot of that when I worked at the paper. I couldn't add things or subtract things. I haven't added anything here, but I have adjusted the colors, the lighting a lot. Although the ones in the morning, I, I like to shoot, you notice, I like to shoot in the evening and I like to shoot in the morning. When the lights are on in the town, it just makes this place magical. And, um, you know, again, I can, I can do that with a drone. I can't do that with a light airplane or something else. I, your shutter speed, of course, you don't have a lot of light, so your shutter speed is slow. And if your craft is moving and you're in a light airplane moving at 80 miles an hour, it's just going to be a blur. I never could shoot that kind of photos from an airplane, but I can from a drone. And all of a sudden, it just opens up all those new possibilities. And uh, so you can tell I'm, I'm really excited about being able to do that. And um, every chance I get, I, I try to get out and fly. So like you mentioned, I, I flew on Tuesday um, after the snowfall. And I was able to do that because it wasn't still snowing. I can't fly in the rain. For one reason, uh, the props whip the water around and get all over your camera, and then you can't see what you're photographing anyway. Uh, but when the weather's good and it's not terribly windy or terribly cold, I, I try to get out and fly just to keep my hand in it. You get better the more you do, and your skills disappear fairly quickly if you don't do it regularly. But it's really a lot of fun. <laughs> hey, Gretchen. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Um, Bob again. Do you know anything about the new uh, 3D technology that they're talking about? I, I'm hearing about about it with the cell phones, but I think it's going to be... Yes, it's a mapping technology. Yeah, would you explain that? Sure. Um, <clears throat> what you do is um, there's mapping software. Uh, you, you fly a drone. A drone makes... Uh, a whole series of photos of, let's say, for example, downtown Salem. And um, <clears throat> this software is able to, uh, and I don't know how it works, but uh, from your image, um, turn that into a uh, three-dimensional three uh, image of downtown, showing the high buildings as... Uh, or the other one that you may be thinking of is there's a mapping software that will give you a topographical map of, of and, and I think that's maybe what you're thinking of. Uh, so you could do a topographical map of Salem showing the highest and lowest areas. And uh, they use that in, in uh, mining or mining and uh, quarries to determine how much volume of uh, material they have. You could determine if you want to say how much crushed gravel have we got here, you could measure that on foot with tape measures and other instruments. But you also can do that by flying a drone over. It has, uh, it takes the pictures and, and with an application it converts that into a topographic map and you can calculate the volume. Those things are kind of beyond me. I just barely, I just barely <laughs> To, to get these things up in the air and keep them from crashing, let alone. <laughs> well, Ron, I think we've run out of time. Okay. So, uh, really appreciate the fascinating. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you for your interest and.